Now I'm back with another video. Today we got strange and terrifying creatures of Native American folklore. It's on both screens. Without further ado, let's get straight into the video. Continuing our journey across the world exploring strange, terrifying, and crazy folklore, we have been to Sweden, and more recently North America. Now for today's episode, we won't have to travel far, as by very popular demand, we will be taking a look at some Native American folklore. If the few Native American legends I've covered so far on the channel are anything to go by, then this should be a very fun episode. Before we go any further, today's video has been sponsored by nope. Babbel, the only language learning platform and application you'll need. In the forests of eastern Canada and the Great Lakes region, the Algonquin people tell stories of a mythical creature, a terrifying spirit evil in nature. Its hunger cannot be satiated, and so it searches for victims to possess. Those who fall under its influence have an uncontrollable desire to murder and cannibalize other human beings. The creature in question is indeed the Wendigo, an enormous monster forged from ice that grows bigger and bigger in line with its appetite. You'll know when one approaches as even the slightest breeze becomes a petrifying chill. The air is filled with a stench that can only be compared to death itself, because that is what follows wherever the Wendigo goes. The Wendigo represents greed, famine, starvation, the cold, and corruption. Its appearance at its core is still somewhat human. That sounds like your governments. Government to control your mind, mental. Do you think it's people actually possessed with this Wendigo? They're not Indigo children, not star children. That's possessed with the Wendigo? Because how do you explain the people that does that? From incest, molestation, bestiality, uh, pedophilia. Jeffrey Dahmer 2.0s. The lure someone in and you impose your will on them and cut them into pieces to eat them. Uh, YouTube, this is all for entertainment purposes only. This is a story. But um, yeah, how do you explain that? Is people inherently irredeemably evil? Or is they roaming Earth with the Archon? Somebody let me know. I feel like it can vary. It could be the trauma in your household growing up. Yeah. Your dad working at a lousy job, little to no money he hated, but he needed to sustain his small ass household. His wife isn't getting any attention, so she's stepping out like stepdaughters and cheating on him. The kids see it. He come back, he beating on her. He end up killing her. The kids see it, and he grew up to be a Richard Ramirez due to being a product of this construct simply. And it varies. You cannot have your father around or whatever. There could be a stepfather that's beating there and... Well, some people die in house fires. Uh, yeah, it, I feel like it varies. Like the in history, even currently, but in history. Explain the people that got the sick, twisted ideas to create Judas Cradles, Blood Eagles, Scaphicism, and Iron Maidens. To even think of a creative way, a very painful, horrendous way to torture someone. Crazy part about it is they never thought about they would be in a position being... In that brazen bull, but you would like to put someone in it. Like, how do you explain that cannibalism and a cult cabal leader dressed up like Jewish claiming to be Jewish? You can keep the name, but you're the furthest thing from God's chosen people. And epigenetic trauma, what they did to the indigenous Aboriginal people, pilgrims, Tuskegee experience. How do you explain that? Is people literally just born that way? Because we are on Earth for some of the aliens. Everybody walking isn't a sun child. That sun doesn't unlock any doormat DNA for them. But, um... I feel like it can, it can vary. It can be your household. It can be what you had or what you didn't have. It can be 
probably epigenetic trauma in your holy holios biblios your son book your bible you will suffer of your father's doings that's not just your father that's your mother seep down through the bloodline through epigenetic memory epigenetic trauma it can be that it can be you're not thinking in your right mind you completely just chemically imbalanced because we're all being chemically molested our food is being tampered with hell they probably doing chants and shit over our food who knows drenched in fluoridated sodium fluoride water gmos genetically modified organisms spray with glossy shit pesticides recycle old food and polish it up and make it look like the shit in a commercial or being chemically cast so it can be someone chemically imbalanced be in a mirror that's construct or what they had going up or what they didn't have or they just walk in with no internal dialogue and something possesses their body to do shit or let me know do you think it varies you know how they say the chimpanzee is a naturally violent animal and you got a group of people out there that point and laugh at a group of people and claim that and they don't even have that that consists of their genetic composition it's a naturally violent animal right 98.7 naturally that gotta be i would think so if you spliced like crispr cas9 genetically modified people here on earth with it that's genetically modified a whole bunch of different animals genetics that make them like this confused organism so it's like it can vary it can be a multitude of things uh let me know what you think let's continue just amplified in the worst ways a dark twisted and terrifying representation of humanity its vices and hardships the Wendigo is a creature we've already covered, so I'll leave a link Never in the description for now. anyone who wants a more detailed explanation. Another creature we've discussed is the Skinwalker, an individual okay. often seen oh, as a is. witch of sorts, who can disguise and transform themselves into an animal. Animals associated with Skinwalkers include coyotes, wolves, bears, dogs, and numerous others. There are several different types of skimwalkers discussed in Navajo culture, but they are always seen in a negative light. Those in the community who are helpful in both a spiritual and physical way will often be referred to as medicine men and women. These men and women embody everything positive about Navajo culture and values. Part of becoming a healer involves learning various practices, including a balance of magic that can be seen as good and also evil. The Skinwalkers can be seen as the polar opposite. They may once have been medicine men and women, but in this process they were tempted by the evil and nefarious arts. The responsibility of this power is too much for some, and the allure of the twisted and dark ceremonies is too strong. They are corrupted and become witches instead. Where a medicine man or woman would use their gifts and ancestral guidance for good, skinwalkers may hide amongst their tribe in plain sight during the day, only to transform and perform these evil acts under the cover of night. Stories and legends relating to skinwalkers are very important, and so they are not really discussed with those considered outsiders. The process of becoming a skinwalker, therefore, is virtually unknown. Some theories suggest in exchange for such power, one would have to perform a truly monstrous ceremony, an irredeemable act, taking the life of someone close to you, perhaps a family member, Given the dark tone and severity of these legends, it's understandable why they are not spoken of in much detail. And we're back in third quarter planning. Adams is quarterbacking this. Horned serpents and dragons appear in most cultures, and Native American cultures are no exception. There are numerous names for these creatures across the many tribes. The Cherokee refer to this serpent as the Uktana, a large underwater serpent with shimmering scales that burn bright, horns, and a crystal located in its forehead. 
The scales and crystals were thought to have magical properties and were used for divination. The horns also had medicinal properties, which would make hunting these serpents terrifying as it may seem a worthwhile endeavour. It's said that a horn serpent that resembles a stag will not harm humans, but its crystal seems to have a magnetic power over other animals. The Cherokee saw this glistening crystal as the greatest prize, however, it was also the greatest danger. Those who encounter the serpent are drawn in by how bright the crystal burns. Rather than flee, they are drawn towards it, and in turn their death. To make the hunt even more challenging, the majority of its scales are impenetrable. The only way to kill the Uktana is by following the rings and spots that run all along its body. The seventh spot from its head is where its heart is located, and this is the only area vulnerable to any kind of attack. There are some stories of these serpents being driven away and destroyed by the Thunderbirds, which segues us nicely into our next creature. Similar to the Horned Serpent, the Thunderbird was thought to occupy the Great Plains and the Great Lakes region. A large bird that could generate thunder by simply flapping its wings, hence the name. Often portrayed as a giant eagle, they sometimes also have control over the rain and other elements of the weather. The conflict between the Horn Serpent and the Thunderbird relates back to an Algonquin story. The Thunderbird reigned over the Upper World, and the Horn Serpent reigned over the Underworld. When these creatures from the Underworld would attempt to invade the Upper World, the Thunderbird watching from above would flap its wings and shoot thunder down at the invading creatures. There are several stories that state the Thunderbirds were created to fight the Underworld spirits, but also to punish humans who broke the morals and codes that governed their society. Although the Thunderbirds were seen as protectors, and you often do see them depicted on totem poles, they still served as a reminder of the morals that were valued. The Dear Woman or Dear Lady is certainly an archetype we see often in folklore, a succubus, siren, or seductive type of monster. Depending on the situation, she can appear in two different lights. For men who remain faithful and take care of their families, she is a spirit associated with love and fertility. However, those who harm women and children encounter a very different creature, a vengeful mon- What is she mixed with, a deer? I heard of the centaur, but what is deer? My apologies, I, I don't even drink, but I had a shot of tequila, I don't know what's going on. I'm paying attention, but let's continue monster who lures and seduces these men to then murder them for their misdeeds and sins. Some believe that seeing the dear woman at first is more of a warning, a reminder that some kind of personal change must occur. If this warning is ignored, the next time you see her will be the last. For those wondering how the dear woman punishes these men, she hides behind a bush or tree and calls out to them, only revealing her human side. As these men are unfaithful, the call of a beautiful woman is more than enough to grab their attention. By the time they are close enough to realise she isn't entirely human, it's already too late. Her hooves are used to trample and stamp her victim to death. I'm sure there's a message there about not taking advantage and treading all over the people who care about you, but being punished by a dear woman who literally treads all over you seems like the perfect amount of irony. Amazon is overcharging you, but I can show you how to avoid it. Don't spend another dime on Amazon. In Cherokee folklore existed a figure known as Spearfinger, a woman with stone-like skin and an elongated, razor-sharp finger on her right hand that this. she would use to slice open her victims. 
she would walk the trails and rivers surrounding the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee and North Carolina. It's said that you can hear Spearfinger humming her favourite song, echoing throughout the mountains and scaring away any nearby wildlife. Although nobody was safe, she preferred to target children, transforming herself into family members to deceive them. She could also take the form of a helpless elderly woman. Those kind enough to offer her assistance are left regretting their decision. Defeating Spearfinger was near- It was crazy, I've heard of weird stories like this, like pretty much some shapeshifter that assume the form of something that you may perceive as innocent or you can trust it, you would go- I heard of weird stories like this growing up. I ain't heard of that name, but what's it? S Spearfinger? Alibaba? This is crazy. Shit. These stories is derivative some from somewhere. One person seen it. Conversation rule the nation to get around. Another one, another one. Like all of it can't be. You got people out there that will create stories to get some kind of glory or fame. But I'm pretty sure there's some fake ones out there for sure, but spear finger <sighs> impossible as her skin was made of stone arrows and any other kind of sharp weapon would merely bounce off her her only known weakness was that her heart was located in her right palm and so she clutches it tight using her elongated finger as protection Eventually, the Cherokee tribes came together and devised a plan to. F her heart was located in her palm. Are you? A Caillou made this story up. This somebody let me know if you heard of Spearfinger. Finally, kill Spearfinger. Under advice from a medicine man, they dug a large pit and, with green sapling, created a bushfire large enough to attract her attention. She came to the village disguised as an elderly woman, asking for assistance. The hunters soon realised this was a disguise and began to attack. The spears thrown bounced and ricocheted. This only angered Spearfinger as she ran towards them. However, this was expected, and in chasing them she had fallen into the pit. Even with her trapped, the Cherokee had no idea how to kill her. They noticed the birds who were once terrified of Spearfinger flew down to offer assistance. One bird began to sing. The sound it was making translated to mean heart. The hunters took this to mean shoot her in her chest, and so they took the bird's advice. The arrows and spears once again could not penetrate Spearfinger's skin, and so they turned to the bird and cut out its tongue, enraged it would lie to them. However, the bird did not lie. The hunters were unaware that her heart was not located in her chest. Another bird flew down, but this time landed on Spearfinger's right hand. The hunters listened again, and began to attack the hand that was always closed so tightly. Only now Spearfinger began to panic. Eventually, one of the spears severed her heart and she fell to the ground. The stone giant that plagued the lands was gone, but the legend and stories of Spearfinger continued. And that brings today's episode to an end. Let me know which of today's stories were your favourite in the comments below. As always, I've been your host, Mythology and Fiction Explained. It sounds like Spearfinger was nothing but a, a, a incest key at one of them, um... movie is that i'm tapping into the akashic records the heels have eyes one of them family members because that's crazy i ain't never heard of spear finger <sighs> i'm down on my last chakra reserves that's it for this video. Don't forget to like the video. If you like the video, comment, share, subscribe, turn on post notifications, DM me the link via X. 
formerly known as Twitter. Let me know what you want me to react to next or what you want me to talk about. Follow me on Twitch, Kick, and Rumble. I'll see you on the next video, man. I'm out.